Welcome to the Filmlings Podcast, a bi weekly podcast where we analyze all that goes into effective filmmaking. I'm Jonathan. And I'm Alex. And this is episode 69, a robotic retrospective. Welcome to the Robotlings Podcast. <laughs> where we're going to talk about uh, lots of robots, different kinds of robots, yeah. and whether some of the robots that we chose this week are actually robots or not. Yeah, yeah. So if you clicked on this thinking, oh, I like robots, and I like uh, learning about robotics, um, sorry, but also, please stick around, because we're going to talk about how uh, <laughs> your field relates to ours. Um, and also, if it helps, I am a trained robotician, Jonathan. That's the technical term, right? Oh, it's not roboticist? That's what I would call it. Uh, I don't know. Robot, robotometrist? Um, <laughs> anyway, yes, I am professionally trained in robotics. I took a class in seventh grade on it um, where we built robots using Legos and then programmed them <laughs> using, like, circles and triangles to tell them to do things. It was, uh, it was a thing. Clearly, I did not Un- decide to do that professionally, but... Here we you are. have undeniable authority on this subject. <laughs> did you take that robotics class, Jonathan? No, I only did animation, actually. Oh, okay. Right, 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 right. I did both, yeah. Um, huh. Anyway. <laughs> so, if there uh, are any questions about robots, come to me on this podcast. Yeah, tweet at Alex, at Alex Garinger. Uh, but for now, let's talk a little bit about the history of robots um, in literature and culture uh, and the idea of, like, artificial people uh, in some form or another kind of goes back all the way to Greek mythology. Um, and these are usually, like, you know, piles of bones or something like that, which would become... Um, automated become humanoid in order to serve different Greek gods and stuff like that, um, which is an interesting part of the discussion today in the fact that uh, this kind of, you know, this loose beginnings of robots comes from this thing that has to be inspired by uh, a divine will of some sort in order to come to being. Um, And then machines uh, with human-like intelligence appear in 1872 in Samuel Butler's Erhuan, which is supposed to be like is nowhere that how you backwards. Say that? I don't know. Uh, it's not a real word. <laughs> um, and then a little bit later on, L. Frank Baum introduces the first humanoid mechanical man uh, in Oz in his Oz series, which is 15 books. Um, That's 15 in 1907. Books? Yeah, there are 15 books in that series. I thought it was like three. Wow, I bet things get pretty (laughs) twisted. Yeah, I can imagine. I have not read them yet. And then in 1921, the word robot, uh, rather than something like mechanical man, uh, is first used. um, And yes, it is the Czech word for servitude or slave, as we saw back in our Edgar Wright episode with um, The World's End. I guess even just saying that is spoilers. But anyway... (laughs) Um, and then in film, which is what we talk about, uh, the first like major appearance of robot, a robot in film is Metropolis, which we talked about. So go check out our, uh, Germany episode. Um, and then, uh, in literature, uh, Isaac Asimov has a huge part to play in the popularization of robots. He coins the term robotics in 1942, his book, I robot, And since then, robots have appeared in many forms in pretty much every medium, uh, whether it's, you know, Android robots like Data in Star Trek um, or, you know, Daleks in Doctor Who. You know, there's just the the idea of robots and uh, Uh, Daleks aren't really robots if we're going to get real nerdy here. Daleks are little tiny evil creatures controlling larger machines. If you want to talk about robots from Doctor Who, talk about Cybermen. All right, I will let Alex take over on that one. But the point is, robots appear in pretty much every um, kind of sci-fi story and even non-sci-fi stories. I mean, you could even, uh, I guess, take her to that level if you want. Um, And yeah, so we're talking about it today, and uh, I think we'll have some interesting conversation. Certainly. So the first film we're going to talk about today is from 1984, the original The Terminator, directed by James Cameron, his second directorial effort, um, and certainly the one that kind of put him on the map as somebody to look out for 
Uh, and this was definitely a scrappy production. We'll talk all about that today as it features the governator. That you, you, <laughs> and you call him the governator because he's the dominator um, in this film. And this is also where Arnold, who has already been doing movies, uh, also kind of makes something special of himself. This and probably Predator are the two things that really vault him into yeah. full, full-blown full stardom. Both of which are still going. Uh but we'll, we'll yeah, get right. That There's later. literally a Terminator and <laughs> movie about to drop, and a Predator movie that just dropped, or is like dropping this weekend. I don't know. Anyway, what's the next movie today, Jonathan? The next movie we move to a much less uh, bloody look at robots with the Iron Giant from 1999, uh, taking the animated, um, I guess, children's movie kind of approach. Uh, and fun fact. This is the first animated film that we've covered on the podcast since episode 16 with Toy Story 3. Is it really? So, yeah, it is. Wow. It has been wow. a while. So. And it kind of relates to that because I like to refer as, to the Iron Giant as the Iron Giant or how Brad Bird got a job at Pixar. So, yeah. Which is true. It so we'll talk in. about that. Yeah. Yeah. It so all if connects. you need a refresher on Pixar, go back to our Toy Story episode. <laughs> and talking about things connecting to other things within this one thing... Our final film today is Ex Machina from 2014, uh, directed by Alex Garland. Uh, it won Best VFX at the Oscars, and it was nominated for Best Original Screenplay. And it is one mind twister of a film that is shot beautifully, has a uh, very 2010s aesthetic to it, um, is crazy and loopy, and draws back to some of those uh, Greek themes that Jonathan was talking about earlier in the ro- intro to robotics section. Yeah, so we have uh, a pretty good swath of different approaches to robots, and let's get into it with our first film. The Terminator from 1984. In the future, artificial intelligence has waged a war to eradicate or enslave all of mankind, but one man named John Connor rose up with a group of rebels to challenge them. The machines send a Terminator back in time to the year 1984 to kill John Connor's mother, Sarah. At the same time, the rebels send Kyle Reese to protect her. Sarah and Kyle must escape the relentless cyborg assassin at all costs. The future of mankind depends on it. All right, thanks, Jason. So in Terminator, we see kind of uh, a classic approach to robots uh, where, you know, in the decades leading up to the 80s, when you have a lot of B-movies that are just constantly looking for exciting bad guys and enemies and... uh, uh, dangerous and frightening things to attack humans, robots are kind of uh, an easy target for that. And so in the Terminator, uh, they kind of give you a reason to be afraid of them because uh, as we're going to talk about, the Terminator is just so relentless and never, ever stops until he uh, executes his mission, pun intended. Because now they just want to kill you. Uh, yep, so this is this is definitely a evil robot. All of the machines are definitely portrayed as evil, both in the uh, routine flashback that just happens throughout this film and the... Or is it a flash forward? I don't know. Anyway. Um, it gets muddy. Yeah, it's kind of both, right? Uh, and and the, uh, the current Arnold Schwarzenegger Terminator that happens in the movie are both have very evil intents. Um, I don't think they really have a sense of morality, so it's not like they're, they're conscious of doing evil. Uh, in fact, they're they're a little mindless in the in the sense that they just have one thing they want to do and they must do it, um, which is both a really freaking scary and two contrasted really well in the script uh, against these two very emotional human beings who are scared for their lives and learning about new worlds, like they're learning about each other's worlds, uh, past, or present and future at the same time, um, which is very confusing and unraveling. And of course they have to fall in love, which I would almost say is like an action horror movie, just movie trope in general, except in this movie, it serves to contrast so well against the complete emotional uh, lack of thought that the Terminator has while he's chasing them down. Yeah, the the romance is definitely, it, it feels the most shoehorned in out of the movie, but they give it like a significance in the plot, so you kind of excuse it uh, to some extent. Um, but yeah, you're right. It's that the, the fear that the Terminator evokes in the characters and in the audience comes from how uh, just how superior it is in 
its build and its strength and how completely unreasoning it is. Like there's no way that you're going to uh, start monologuing with it like you would with a human bad guy and like change its mind and all that kind of stuff. Like this thing is just going to kill you uh, and that's that's it. There's <laughs> there's like no other options um, and it's also incredibly difficult to kill itself and so it's just terrifying the way that it it is so nonstop and relentless, which is kind of the big word. Um, because also the film kind of parallels that relentlessness in the pacing. This movie goes really, uh, I wouldn't say like it's speed. It's not like really fast, but it's just nonstop, uh, suspense. Yeah. The whole film kind of functions as one large chase scene, right? Like we start off with yeah. the, with the view of the future, right? And then with the, like the skull crushing and such, and also, how did all those skulls get in one pile? But that's a question for another day. <laughs> it's like they... Art direction, Alex. Well, I know that. But, like, <laughs> so were the robots, like, doing propaganda? Because that would suggest that they have some kind of reasoning element in them that understands human emotion. But... I kind of felt... It, it, it almost seemed like a, like a concentration camp. Like, uh, once all these slaves die, they just kind of throw them in a pit or something. And that's where this particular fight is happening. Yeah, but then where are the rest of their skeletons? Also, like, I'm clearly asking dumb questions here. We know why all the skulls are in a pile. It's because it looked cool. Um, yeah. So, yeah, this movie starts off with these two guys appearing from the uh, appearing from the future in these balls of electricity that destroy, like, the sphere around them. Um, one, who's incredibly strong and appears in a perfect kneeled stance and is muscled like a professional bodybuilder, because he is, um, and the other who flops on the and ground and proceeds to rip someone's heart out. Yeah, right. Uh, and the other <laughs> guy just flops on the ground in complete contrast. This movie does contrast really well. Um, yeah, it does. And it does parallels really well too. I mean, the the first thing we see in the present is a truck, as well. Like big tank rolling over skulls in the future. Go back, big uh, garbage truck who's having just a really hard time picking up a trash can. Um, but yeah, we start off with these two guys appearing in the present, and then from that point forward, there's no stopping until you reach the very, very end. Like it's a constant. And even chase. then, it like you think it's done like three times before it's actually over. <laughs> yeah, right. Just high tower surprise, high tower surprise, high tower surprise. Yeah, and the the other thing that kind of surprised me for this movie because this was actually my first time watching the film, um, but it was how long it takes to actually reveal that Arnold Schwarzenegger is a robot and and for a while it's just there's two guys come came back in time we presume from the titles at the beginning and all that um and they're both chasing after the same woman and we get based on how violent each one of them is which one is the good guy uh Sarah Connor doesn't get that though she just thinks that there's two guys after her to kill her um until uh, she realizes that Kyle Reese is actually trying to protect her. And it's a good like 30 minutes before we go into the robot vision of the Terminator and then another like 15 minutes until he starts uh, cutting open his skin and repairing himself and you see all the gizmos and stuff. Uh, and you see underneath. that really, really plastic face. Yeah, the effects in, in this movie are something we should touch on because um, it's kind of at that that peak point where uh, films were getting really audacious with the kinds of effects they were doing, but CG hadn't really hit its peak with things like uh, Jurassic Park yet. So we get a lot of stop motion and a lot of uh, clear uh, dummy swaps. Um, but yeah, right. I think for all that, if you know what you're looking for, it still works. Yeah, yeah, clearly. And also, this is definitely, this is not like a blockbuster in any sense of the word. You know, Terminator now, if a Terminator movie drops, we know two things about it. One, it's big budget. And two, it's probably going to be bad. But um, <laughs> but this was not a large budget movie. This was a uh, up and coming uh, scrappy uh, film director who was trying to get his project made. And he had to shoot a lot of the scenes pretty much just on his own. In fact, the scene... Uh, where Arnold, the, the Terminator, steals a station wagon um, 
was shot after the movie was completed, like a couple weeks after, with just James Cameron and Arnold Schwarzenegger. And they were doing it real low-key because they didn't have any permits. And they didn't want anyone to call the cops on him because Arnold was smashing a window. Also, Arnold smashes a lot of windows in this movie. (laughs) Yeah, he's he's the window terminator. (laughs) Right? That's what he's really good at. Also, we should say (laughs) that... The theme of this today's episode is robot, right? But it, is is the Terminator a robot? I mean, to to you and I, he is. But uh, Kyle Reese literally says after uh, Sarah Connor's like, "Oh, it's a robot." It's like, "No, he's a cyborg." Um, immediately afterwards. So I'm I'm not going to get into the intellectual difference between the two, but the movie seems to put a distance between them. Yeah, but it's funny because I I would contest it um, because in my mind anyway at this point uh, and maybe it's become different just you know through more sci-fi happening and and more actual science happening Uh, but in my mind Cyborg is a human that has had uh, limbs or parts of their body replaced or uh, augmented with uh, machinery um, of, of some sort or another I don't think that taking a machine and putting human skin on it constitutes, which maybe it does, but uh, that's just not how I see it typically. Yeah. And thinking about now, I'm, uh, my best guess is that the reason that those lines are set up that way is to, uh, get through exposition in an interesting way that doesn't feel super duper forced. Um, this movie, <laughs> this movie is one of those uh, one of the films that had to get a lot of information out really quick to build a whole world, un- unknowingly building a whole franchise. But that wasn't really a thing back then. Um, right. Building building a whole world and explaining it to the audience so that it makes sense and trying to find ways to do it so that it doesn't feel like you're just being talked to. Because you're you're uh, if you go back to those '60s robot movies that you were talking about, Jonathan, I mean there was a lot of like dense ex- just explanation of science or made up science uh, to try to yeah. keep the the audience along. But here, you know, at, by having it part of a snappy retort of like, no, it's a cyborg. He has. He has skin over his metal that makes him look human. He <laughs> blends in perfectly. He doesn't look like a plastic makeup bot at all. Um, that's the good way to get out that information. Um, and to that end, we should also point out that a lot of the information in this film is either developed uh, or uh, given out right at the front through the flashback, flash forward, whatever it is, the flash flash. And the text at the beginning. And the text to just get it out there get it going and then here's this really interesting scene thank you for reading our text um right and then there's another big information dump pretty early on in the film right after Kyle Reese uh has his come with me if you want to live line which it's much more famous than the second movie I would say um and they're they're racing through the streets Kyle Reese and Sarah Connor in a car and while they're having this car chase uh, Kyle Reese is trying to calm her down and explain why he's not going to kill her and then gives her all of this information like all at once but you know you're you're taking in all this information at the same time that you're getting a car chase so it's not so bad because <laughs> it's still really interesting yeah and you're, you're flipping and it's also warranted yeah no it's totally earned it at that point it's paying dividends on like here's all this information that you need to know you you have all these questions here's the answers and here's a car chase on top of it um yeah so that doesn't feel but i mean also the fact that sarah connor needs to know that information and he would just be explaining it to her <laughs> you know yeah, it's totally. not like people who already everyone knows what's going on but they're just re-explaining it for the sake of the audience yeah, totally. um, but also for the sake of the pacing of this movie like that that information doesn't happen when it's at a standstill it has to happen yeah. while it keeps going because this movie is about going and in terms of that relentlessness do you gonna do you want to uh dip into spoilers and talk about the the ends of the film uh yeah sure why not let's do it so at the end of this you know hour and a half long chase movie sarah connor and kyle reese um Ha, are in another car chase with the Terminator and they end up crashing um, and both the cars end up crashing and Kyle Reese and Sarah Connor are alive and you think the Terminator's dead 
until the Terminator's not dead and he comes back for them and then they blow it up and then he's still not dead and he's just keeps coming towards them. Uh, and at this point, like all of his artificial skin has been melted off and he's just this, uh, stop motion skeleton, which is very famous and actually still really cool. Um, and he chases them into, uh, this convenient machinery factory thing, um, to the point where convenient machinery uh, <laughs> for all your machinery needs. <laughs> they they blow up the skeleton again, and then it's half of a skeleton, and Kyle Reese dies in the process, and the skeleton is still chasing Sarah Connor uh, with one arm, and finally she crushes its head in um, this hydraulic pr- press kind of thing. But that's just that's all part of the thing of of how. This type of this approach to robot is so terrifying because it never stops. And, um, you know, you have to kill it over and over and over and over again uh, before it before you can actually get rid of it and uh, overcome it. And there's no other way. You can't like rewire it or or anything like that. Um, Except don't they literally rewire it in the next movie? Well, that's (laughs) that's true. Um, they rewire it to uh, escape from another relentless robot. Um, and that's actually an interesting point, Alex, because um, Terminator 2 actually is very similar in some respects to the Iron Giant, um, because in the next movie, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's version of the Terminator is sent back and uh, has to protect child John Connor, who teaches him that killing is not good in all circumstances and has to uh, teach him how to uh, temper his programming, if you will, Um, which is what we're going to see in just a moment. Yeah, and the Iron Giant is voiced by Vin Diesel, another big muscly guy, (laughs) Um, except I shouldn't say voiced, I should say grunts. He's grunted by Vin Diesel. But before we go... Uh, I want to mention one little uh, interesting, I almost I hesitate to say fun, but interesting trivia fact about the Terminator, and that was that one O.J. Simpson was considered for the role, but deemed too nice uh, in appearance and demeanor to be a cold-blooded killer. Uh, that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> Presented without comment, now yep. we move on to our next film. The Iron Giant from 1999. At the height of the Cold War, a mysterious object falls from the sky near a rural American town. When young Hogarth Hughes discovers what turns out to be a huge metal man, he is determined to keep it hidden until the rest of the world is ready to greet him with peace. But keeping a giant robot isn't easy, and Hogarth must enlist the help of a scrap metal artist named Dean to help take care of his new friend while a communist hunting government agent is on his trail. Along the way, Hogarth teaches the Iron Giant how to use his powers for good and choose not to act upon the darker parts of himself. All right, so with the Iron Giant, you kind of have a setup for um, a perfect, like, kids' fantasy adventure movie. Uh, You have a kid uh, with no father figure who is in in need of a father figure. For some reason, that just works out well for kids' adventures. You just have a perfect setup of characters between an adventurous kid who's kind of already got a um, the boy who cried wolf thing going on with his uh, with his mother. You have a giant metal alien sentient wolf in the form of a giant robot who happens to be super sympathetic and also have his own basket of issues um, in that he can't really talk he doesn't understand what's going on he's very good at lining up railroad tracks and we just wish he was a little faster at it um <laughs> he you know. wishes he was faster at it too now yeah yeah so he lands and he provides both like this adventure that this boy is clearly craving and uh, a bundle of mysteries and uh problems to just propel the plot along as far as like setup for a movie goes like the plot is spot on. You don't have to wonder about where it's yeah uh, about how it's going to go uh, because you know it's going to go somewhere. Like it has to from the get go. It's not uh, relentless in the way that the Terminator is. In fact, it's got a lot of like really fun moments to it that don't feel like it's yeah. rushing. But uh, the and some plot, very touching, thoughtful moments, right? But the plot is just driven so well that it almost effortlessly glides through its story in a very compelling way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and real quick, Alex, uh, the tagline for this movie is it came from outer space. 
<laughs> Speaking of B movies, yeah, right. Isn't um, that which? Uh, have we done that on the podcast? Is that something else? I feel like I've seen this. Uh, I think it's just like a a tropey tagline for every B movie uh, about Martians or something. Ever. I mean, it's classic 1950s 1960s title. I'm looking it up but, now because I'm pretty sure it's actually a movie. This movie has uh, so much nostalgia and referentialism in it, um, not overtly, but in little things like uh, when Hogarth is watching the TV and he sees this show where like a brain is coming alive as like an homage to the thing or something like that. Um, it came from outer space from 1953, directed by Jack Arnold. Ah, perfect. There you go. <laughs> um so yeah, this movie ha- is very self-aware. It knows that it's falling into a long line of uh, schlocky B uh, monster movies, um, and it attempts and succeeds to rise above that and to put a lot of depth and heart and um, you know thematic significance into uh, what had been a very worn out uh, subject. Yeah, yeah, right. Like it's it's very much a different movie. Uh, and and weirdly enough, in terms of just animation style, you know what it reminds me of? What Treasure Island? Yeah, a little bit. Treasure Island has some of those uh, 3D elements. I don't think they had started incorporating 3D elements quite yet. Um, in in the Iron Giant, but it does have. Oh, uh, Iron Giant definitely has 3D animation in it from like the get go. It is. Oh, does it? Oh, yeah, 100%. Oh, yeah. You can tell in the way it moves. Just like, like little pieces. No, like almost the whole, like every single movement of the, the giant is clearly like 3D, uh, done in a 3D animation app. But the, the I mean, he looks 2D. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, Even if he's not, moving in a 3D. Yeah, they're not modeled yeah, treasure- to look 3D. They're just done with 3D programs. They're 2D models. Right, with 3D. but Treasure Planet has 3D objects in a 2D animated film, does basically. It? Um, it does. It, once you pay attention to it, it's kind of weird, actually. Mm. <laughs> That's what I get. <laughs> I didn't I go through saying. the same pirate phase that Jonathan went through in school, so I don't. I don't know. Yeah, we'll have to get to that someday. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, it has that same kind of uh, fantastical. Um, kind of a look to it and it's got a very similar um heart driven premise uh which is why this movie is so important and such an interesting addition to um this selection because this is the film where um the iron giant comes out of space comes out of nowhere uh in the middle of the cold war one of the most untrusting times um in specifically american history um and you know, it has to teach the other characters in the film and ultimately the audience how to um, get to know something before you criminalize it and uh, and just become afraid of it and destroy it for no reason. Yeah. Which is still and an ever present and ever uh, an evergreen theme that is always relevant. Yeah. Right. And I, I find it interesting that this movie, which comes out after the. Uh uh, the Cold War uh, nails like this nostalgic vibe for the 50s just so so well uh, it feels like a, like a Norman Rockwell painting or like a Douglas Sirk movie almost that happens in like the northeast with all these fall colors about um, yeah. very ideal. and you mentioned that in your notes because the town is actually called Rockwell yeah <laughs> no it's a pretty it's a pretty blatant which reference. is awesome yeah I think when I saw that, I was trying to connect it too much to uh, Roswell, so I didn't pick up on that. <laughs> yeah, perhaps, perhaps. And you know what? We should talk about that again, because in the first movie, we had I, I had my whole bit about a cyborg, which ended up being about, you know, this is, this is how you get uh, exposition out in a movie without being, like, completely dry and boring about it. Um, but in this movie, again, the robot, is it, like, really a robot? Because isn't it just an alien? Is it an alien robot? Is it a robot I think built it's by an, aliens? Yeah, I would call it an alien robot, whether or not it's like a species of robots, if you can even say those words together, um, 
or if it was, like you said, built by aliens. It definitely comes from outer space. It's the tagline. Yep. <laughs> um, maybe, but it's maybe also... Maybe this robot terminated all of its creators long ago, and now it's just the robots on its planet. Oh, snap. Yeah. That's intense. Throw that in your head, uh, Cannon. And it's definitely, it's definitely capable of it from what we see at the end of the movie. Um, but... But yeah, I think the fact that it is still a, uh, you know, a machine that has um, some level of intelligence, whether, you know, there, it, the movie never delves into how much the it's programmed or where it comes from or any of that. So on the flip side of your spy, cyborg exposition, this film has no exposition as far as what the Iron Giant is. Yeah. It just like asks you to accept it. And that's what we do, because that's what the whole movie is about, yeah. is well, accepting and learning. Well, the so the Terminator, to a certain extent, is about dealing with uh, the unknown, right? It's about, like, confronting the unknown. Uh, the Iron Giant is about the unknown in the sense that uh, it's about the fun of exploring the unknown and getting, getting to know but not fully know the unknown. So the joy yeah. in... Uh, in uh, and, and the Iron Giant is the searching, but the 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 fun part of the Terminator should I call it fun? Maybe the entertaining part is the the confrontation once you've discovered the mystery that you're after. Yeah, and the I, I mean it's it's a little multifaceted because that's kind of Hogarth's side of the story, and then I mean from the Iron Giant's perspective, it's about also memory loss. Um, <laughs> it has a little bit of a Jason Bourne element to it, um, but it, it has that element of um, no matter where you come from or what you can do, you don't always have to do what you can do uh, on impulse. You know, you can uh, choose to make better decisions um, regardless of what situation that you're in. Um, so there's, you know, there's a lot of themes going on packed into this movie. Yeah, yeah, no, it's very, uh, it's very intelligent in what it's packing into it, and it hits its emotional beats really well. In fact, you know, this yeah. isn't the first time I've seen this movie, um, and this weekend, this, uh, th- this past couple of weeks when I've been doing research for this episode, uh, it was a rewatch for me, and it, it took me a while to work up to actually watching the end because I knew it was going to make me really sad. Um, yeah, but you know. The, the way it hits its emotional beats so well goes back to our Pixar episode, uh, which is also about animation and also about hitting emotional beats really well. Um, and also in completely, signific- completely significant to this because all of the talent that uh, Brad Bird uh, sh- uh, displays in this movie is what gets him the gig at Pixar. Um, although I do yeah, enjoy that he's got... one of the founding directors. Yeah, and I do enjoy that he gets to have a a uh, a successful career making animated features before Pixar cuz uh I mean Pixar has some dark moments but I don't know if they in the climax they would kill off a character. I mean right. there was the that imaginary friend and in and out and don't get me wrong I'm still teary about that but you know <laughs> like to actually just obliterate a real life physical tangible character it would be brutal for a Pixar movie. And even even the deer scene is so poignant um, when Hogarth uh, gets an opportunity to teach the Iron Giant about what death is. And all of these, even the fun moments in this movie are all leading up to the climax. They're all building on each other. Nothing is extraneous. Um, And uh, so in this moment when um, the Iron Giant sees a deer and... uh, you know, sees how beautiful it is. And then it gets shot by these hunters and he has to learn that it, it's not alive anymore. Um, then we have stakes for at the end when the iron giant has to sacrifice himself. And as a children's movie that everyone should have seen, um, I'm not, I'm not going to include spoilers. <laughs> um, but when he has to sacrifice himself, he knows the stakes. It's not, uh, just oh, kind of in, a, a whimsical decision. Robot. He doesn't know about death. Um, right. Yeah, no, none of that. he knows. He knows what he's doing. He knows what's up when he goes into that uh, bright, bright burning light. <laughs> and then he's still alive somehow. It, I, um, can't, I can't ever figure out the end. Is he still alive? I think so. I think he goes to like the Arctic and rebuilds himself 
was like the beginning of Frankenstein or something. Are there any sequels? There are not, as far as I know. Do you think they had to Which do is with actually, Bradbury? is basically a feat in itself. Yeah, right? That's really weird, especially because there's that kind of cliffhanger moment where it could be a sequel. Yeah, it's it definitely has that uh, possibility, but they never went with it, so we'll just have yeah. to wait a couple years until some Somebody does money it. hungry <laughs> Hollywood exec is like, let's do that. Yeah, why not? Let's reboot it. We'll make it a uh, we'll make it an online streaming service on a ridiculous uh, website. That's what we'll do. We'll get Vin Diesel to motion capture it. <laughs> oh jeez, they'll just put him in a cardboard um, cutout outfit of the robot <laughs> that would be a great uh if vin diesel did that at like a comic con or something that would be pretty great so as opposed to in the terminator where robots are the uh antagonist to be feared and destroyed at all costs um in the iron giant we get a much more nuanced uh approach and we get um kind of a classic sci-fi approach of the robot as a placeholder for the other of the unknown of something that you don't understand um, and have very strong feelings against, even though you don't understand them. Um, And so uh, in that respect, I think uh, it falls into a long line of classic sci-fi where you use these fantastical elements to represent real world issues. Um, And it gives the iron giant a, uh, a scope of influence and um, resonance outside of just being a kid's movie. Like this movie is still uh, very poignant and thought provoking for um, anyone of all ages, uh, even today, maybe even more, especially today. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all of the influences that this movie draws from um, are, are films that were created for adults and that were using the genre of sci-fi um, and specifically like aliens and robots. Uh, two episodes available on the Fillings podcast um, to tackle larger themes that would be relevant to the audience viewing them. Um, and this movie does that, but in a way that comes off as unpretentious and genuine and heartfelt Um mostly through the use of using a child who has to teach who typically fills in the role of like the innocent who has to be taught but has a large powerful being who then fills in the role of the innocent needing to be taught which is always tugs on our heartstrings it's a perfect perfect way to you know just play your audience like a fiddle and pull them along it works in that scene hat first half of that scene with the little girl in frankenstein it'll work there here and nobody gets thrown in the water yeah, it's interesting that um, Hogarth seems so mature. You know, he's he's basically more mature than half the adults in the film. Uh, and he uses that in order to um, teach and basically raise the Iron Giant and kind of guide him through um, the, the current state and the current culture that the Iron Giant has literally just dropped into. Um, and so, yeah, it would be a very different movie. And I guess I guess that's kind of a theme throughout a lot of kids' movies is that the kid is the one who um, kind of has a better perspective on things than the adults, and they have to... Uh, they are kind of the, the guiding force, um, which gives kids a, a good role model and, uh, you know, someone to be like, so... Yeah, and I don't think it's necessarily untrue either. I don't think this idea of uh, kids in films being miniature adults is necessarily un unsynced with reality to the full extent because i've uh you know there's plenty of kids out there who are more mature than some adults i've met yeah <laughs> let's move on to a uh, a movie whose plot is clear and obvious and not at all hard to understand ex machina from 2014 All is not what it seems when a software programmer named Caleb wins a week staying at the estate of Nathan, the CEO of his company, a multi-billion dollar tech enterprise called Blue Book. 
Nathan informs Caleb that his task for the week will be to engage in a Turing test, which comprises of a series of interviews with an android he has made named Ava, to determine if she has achieved true artificial intelligence. As the week goes on, Caleb is confronted with the curiosity, ingenuity, and sexuality of Ava, as well as the manipulation, ambition, and instability of Nathan. Eventually, he must choose where to place his sympathies. All right, so as you can see, the plot of this movie, very simple. You know, even a baby could understand what's going on in this movie <laughs> and understand all of the thematic significance. Um, a baby well-versed in uh, Greek dramatic theory and uh, Turing tests. <laughs> yes, yes, and the uh, uh, landscape of Iceland. Um, I don't actually know if this It's probably like Canada or something. That's meant to be. But it definitely it's looks very like Iceland. It's very, very beautiful. Um, and like the first time I watched this movie, I thought the landscape was just like, oh, let's have some pretty stuff in the background. But then I realized like, oh, it's natural. It's wonderful. It's it's a contrast to yeah this thing that Surrounding you're questioning this. whether or not it can fit into the natural order or not. Yeah, yeah. Surrounding this artificial rat maze um, with like just gorgeousness and hugeness of nature everything's thematic um but yeah so (laughs) so this movie is um the post black mirror kind of technophobic approach that's the way i look at it because um you know this comes after black mirror and i think about black mirror a lot in relation to this movie because both of these actors have had large roles in black mirror episodes um and pretty much all the Black Mirror episodes are and some and Star Wars. That's true, but that's not quite as relevant. <laughs> um, but in Black Mirror, practically every episode is some kind of cautionary tale of um, what our current technological and social media um, environment could lead to. And it always ends in a very dark and uh, very tragic ending um and this movie kind of falls right in line with that this is it it gives us both sides of the robot so we approach it in a very um kind of cautious way but also an optimistic way because we want this to be kind of a breakthrough and something that would be great and uh it starts us off on a very sympathetic um footing with it and then it just leads us down this crazy uh labyrinth where you know, we're, we'll talk about spoilers at the end. I really want to uh, give an opportunity to not spoil this movie uh, before you go watch it. It is available on Netflix, so um, if you would like to go watch it, you may. All right, Jonathan, let's talk about one of uh, my personal fears, uh, AI. That's all this movie is about, so... Yeah, yeah, no, it's <laughs> I about I hope you slept AI. well after. It's about the fear of AI, um... It very much It's feels, about the trust of AI, too, to some extent. Yeah, to, to a certain extent, because, like, an AI runs the home. The security functions on the house are very much just part, an extension of, um, I can't remember his actual name, but Oscar Isaac's character's uh, control. Like Nathan, his, yeah. Nathan, yeah. He, he very much is acting uh, in, like, he has a god complex. Like, he very clearly has a god complex over the course of the movie. Yeah. Um, or he's in control of everything and he wants to breathe new life into this thing. Um, kind of is- see. Okay. This is an interesting thing about Nathan is that I wasn't sure like through this whole movie, I was going back and forth on all of the characters and how much we should trust them. Uh, really? and I was basically very skeptical of everyone. I, I thought, um, I was going back and forth between Nathan is like very in control of everything. He knows exactly what's going on, what's going to happen. He's not going to let anything unexpected happen. And then as the movie went on, I realized, oh, no, he's actually kind of uh, lackadaisical. Like all these binges are real. And he's, uh, you know, he he's not the like mad he's scientist too com- who puts he's too all confident of his- in himself. Yes, he's very confident in himself, um, but he's not the mad scientist that only focuses on his work. Um, And I flip-flopped on Ava the whole time, and I flip-flopped on Caleb and whether he was a robot or not. And I guess that's one of the the things that... Nah, man, Caleb wasn't a robot. I know, but the movie 
um, at least acknowledged my suspicions when they have Caleb uh, cut his wrists when he starts doubting whether he's a robot or not. Um, and that's one of the one of the really interesting things about this movie is basically everything that I was being very suspicious about the movie addressed at some point um, because this movie being just four years ago now is coming in a long line of science fiction and a long line of robot stories. And so it knows that um, the audience has probably seen a lot of those, knows a lot of the twists that are often uh, used. And so it apprehends them and then um, answers them basically as you're asking the question, So, which I think is really smart. So to me, I didn't read the like tension or suspense in this movie as strongly as I read like the tragedy part of it in in the very traditional sense, like the Greek tragic right. sense, which I know is something you picked up on too. Yeah. But to me, when I watched this movie, and the first time I saw it, I actually saw it at the ArcLight. I remember that uh, in Hollywood. Um, maybe maybe it's not quite in Hollywood. Maybe it's slightly out. Anyway, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I um, but. Uh, it was almost so smart that like you knew everybody was playing everybody um, and so you could kind of see everybody's flaws like everybody thought they were so smart but clearly they were going to mess up on something and you, you could see the flaws in each of them Ava's desire is like her is, is her hubris uh, Nathan's god complex is his and um I don't want to say emotional vulnerability because that sounds so generic, but like, uh, what's his face? Caleb. Caleb. Caleb was just so prone to being played. Like he was clearly just being played by both of them the entire time. And you're wondering, yeah. you were wondering who, who he was going to side with for like the first half of the movie until the second half of the movie when it's very clear who he's going to side with. Yeah. Um, and, and then you're just wondering how it's going to screw him over. So to me, I, I see, a bunch of people just falling fatally into their own uh, hubris, their own tragic flaws, and s- s- watching it be their downfall, which is like the tragedy in the Greek tragedy. Yeah, and I think Caleb was kind of the most interesting element in that to me because um, the movie would be very different if Caleb had like any self confidence whatsoever. Um, and yeah, I know if he they- had a backbone. <laughs> Right. And I know that they explain like, you know, that he was chosen specifically because he's kind of pathetic and, uh, you know, wants to wants that validation. He needs that validation, which is what he's getting on both sides um, from Ava and from Nathan and is basically why the movie works. But while I was watching it, I was just like, Caleb, can't you see that you're being played because he's. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how to describe him other than like pathetic at, at points. And he is oh, intelligent. Totally. He is intelligent. He's just um, he's too trusting on basically every account. Yeah. So I'm going to get real nerdy on you here, Jonathan, for a second. Go for it. So when it comes to uh, tabletop role playing games. Yep, I'm going there, especially right. D&D. There, there are a few different stats that refer to a person's mental capacity. One is intelligence, and one is wisdom. And Caleb is a character with a lot of intelligence, but, like, no wisdom. So he has no idea what's going on with other people. He can't read them. He can't understand what they're thinking. His emotional intelligence is basically nil. But um, but he's really smart <laughs> for yeah. whatever that's yeah. worth in this movie. And it does actually play a factor. Yeah, it just made him kind of frustrating to watch sometimes. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I totally get it. And you're right. His his situation in this uh, in this film is very much like an unvalidated uh, beta male trying to find validation both in like the uh, female ideal and the alpha male on the other side. Like the, yeah. the roles in this film are very strong. Uh, and to me, like that's always the part that has stuck out about this movie to me. As, as super duper significant like the uh, the sci-fi aspect is really interesting it's a really fun a plot it's it's uh, very suspenseful um, it has a fascinating ending that makes you go huh but the uh, 
the the even the, the part that really sticks with me is how these uh, almost like stand-ins or summations of these entire facets of society or these societal ideals that we have not saying that anybody actually fits those um, fit together yeah and I mean we should talk about um, the AI the robot in this movie uh, Ava um, because I think the the AI element to her is what makes her unique out of these three. Um, it's not really delved into in the other two because AI has become much more of kind of a topic of fascination uh, fairly recently. But the the fact that the whole film is based on this test of does she have true intelligence? Um, does she have an intelligence outside of um, what has been programmed into her by Nathan? Um, and I think one of the interesting elements that goes into that is when Nathan shows the brain and how it's like this fluid, uh, what's he call it? He calls it like liquid wear or something or wetware, um, as opposed to software, um, where it's basically mimicking a human brain and forming new connections and that kind of thing, uh, which is one way to actually justify true artificial intelligence. Cause it's really hard to, uh, kind of follow that through all the way when you've got, um, you know, hardware where you have set um, connections and programming that is going through um, your robot. Uh, That's as, as close as this podcast is getting to actual robotics. <laughs> right. Hey, I'm supposed to be the robotics expert here. What the what the heck? But that element is, um, you know, what drives the whole movie. It is where because uh, we're questioning it the whole time. We don't know exactly if she has achieved this artificial intelligence or not, um, which is where a lot of my suspicion of her was coming from was whether this was all just a really clever program written by Nathan in order to, uh, dupe Caleb because the true Turing test is, um, basically one human is getting, uh, typed responses from two different sources that they cannot see. One is a computer and one is a human. And if they cannot accurately distinguish which uh, responses were written by the computer and which one was written by the human, uh, then the computer passes the artificial intelligence test. And this movie goes so far as to um, show that Ava is a robot um, because we're seeing her mechanical body uh, throughout most of the film. And which is important, which is very important uh, because, you know, because Caleb knows that it's a machine and they address this. Uh, Nathan says, like, yeah, the real test is knowing that she's a machine. Will you still re respond to her the same way that you would to a human? Um, and that's, you know, the whole premise of the film. Yeah. Yeah. And even going a bit farther, like the fact that he can see her is is important to, you know, one, Caleb being like a complete push over um and two the ways in which she manipulates him over the course of the film which uses her uh i don't know both programmed and uh ai developed sexuality to uh i don't know if nova seduce is the accurate word to charm caleb uh into being her lackey almost over the course of the film yeah and uh it's going to be hard to go much farther than that without just giving the spoiler warning. So I might just put it down right now and say, if you don't want to know about the end of this movie, then go watch it and then come back. So yeah, not only like her sexuality, but also just, uh, sympathy, which, uh, is an interesting take like from the iron giant where, you know, we are supposed to feel sympathetic for the robot because, um, they're, being abused or uh, uh, want to be destroyed for no reason because they're not understood. Um, that kind of carries over into the beginning of or into a lot of Caleb's perspective where he feels bad for Ava and we're supposed to feel bad for Ava uh, because Nathan is like um, this drunkard and we see all this footage of how uh, all these other robots were um, basically kept in captivity and they wanted out. Um, and so we feel bad for her. And so we're on the same side as Caleb by the time that uh, we realize that that's exactly what she wanted and how she um, was able to uh, to get out of the maze that she's in, which is basically literally just a huge um, rat maze that Caleb is the key to. And Nathan 
gives Ava the key to see if she can actually use it to escape. Um, which brings us to a couple of questions um, about the film as a whole, now that we have the ending on the table, um, which is, Alex, do you think that Nathan intended for Ava to escape, whether she killed him or not? Ah, uh, no. Because he's he gives her the key, and he want you know he's trying to make artificial intelligence. No, I don't think he wanted to. I think he was, uh, because having so having uh, one of his robots, and there were several. That there's a big section of the film that explains that Ava was not the first. Um, that having one of his robots escape um, would have proved that he was as smart as he was. Yeah, but he didn't. He wouldn't have actually known what to do had he gotten there. He was like a dog chasing his tail, uh, kind of in that regard. Also, I'd like to point out that Ava, a- Ava. I don't know why I keep saying Ava. Ava is very clear in in the film that she charges herself through the floor panels. And unless she's That's got, true. like, a USB mini adapter on her, I don't know what she's going to do out in the real world. I don't know how <laughs> she made it all the way to the city. Well, she had a helicopter. Also, is yeah. that point just, like, a fantasy on her part? Is she just lying dead in the field at the end of the movie? <laughs> I can't imagine I she has, like, a low power requirement. Like, she's going to run out of battery. Know, we, I mean, we don't know what that limit is. You know, we're, te- we're talking about futuristic technology obviously so maybe she can go for like a week and in that time she plans to build her own charger system or whatever or she'll just eat power lines like the iron giant <laughs> i think she's dead um yeah and i think you're right um also because uh nathan says that he thinks that the next one will be the one he thinks that the next model will be the one that'll uh, actually pass his test which is yeah. not a turing test ultimately the turing test is like uh is kind of a, I guess it's like the Turing test 2.0. Um, yeah. But also like where are our sympathies supposed to be at the end of the movie? Um, because I don't know. I don't feel that bad for Caleb. I don't feel bad for Nathan. I don't really feel excited for Ava. I don't, I'm not exactly sure where I'm supposed to be at the end. Maybe I'm just supposed to be, uh, confused and thinking about all the different things that went on. Yeah, I think so. I think you're just supposed to kind of sit back and watch the chaos. Because, I mean, definitely over the course of the film, you just see two uh, characters manipulate the crap out of one who's completely, (laughs) completely pathetic. Yeah, just Um, a wet noodle. Yeah, not really. It doesn't doesn't really have anything going for him other than uh, an initial innocence of sorts to really make him appealing to the audience or anybody. Um so I don't know. Maybe you could root for the helicopter pilot. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, but the last thing, aside from robotics getting more into um, dramatic theory, is going back to the title. So the title is Ex Machina, which is a very clear reference to Deus Ex Machina, uh, which is Latin for God from the Machine, um, which is an idea that comes from the Greeks, uh, where in a Greek tragedy... Um, literally at near the climax, a, uh, one of the Greek gods, um, it, as a character in the play would be raised, uh, either by a crane or through, um, a platform up through a trap door, uh, in the floor in order to resolve the conflict. And nowadays it's seen as, um, as a trope and a cliche, a way to get your characters out of tight situations, um, by just introducing something completely unforeseen or unmentioned beforehand. Um, and I still haven't totally uh, decided what the implications of the title are for the story. I Thoughts? mean, it feels like it definitely sets up like that Greek tragic theme for sure. Yeah. But I mean, is Which it is, is is Caleb the Deus Ex Machina that uh, Nathan drops in the um, drops into his own story basically and allows Ava to escape? Um, a bit of both. I mean, Nathan's also crucial to it too. I mean, he created Eva. Ava, in a sense, he is the the plays the God character in this movie. Yeah, and uh, I think to some extent, Ava becomes a Deus Ex Machina if you extend beyond the end of the film to the point where 
Ava is raised out of the laboratory and into the real world. And um, what implications does that have uh, afterwards? Yeah, I still think she's dead in a field, but whatever. <laughs> I don't think there's there's any taxi driver speculations uh, in this film. Alex is very concerned about Ava's power. I'm not concerned. I'm hoping she's dead. <laughs> that's that's where I'm coming from. I don't want a freaking AI robot wandering around the world. That's a whole yeah. problem we don't need. That's true. We don't um, need we don't need it. We don't need a new civil rights issue springing up. We don't need to bill ourselves a new slave class. A, we don't uh, need any of that. A district 9 with AI. Yeah, we don't we don't need it. That's essentially what you you're just you're creating a new sentient creature for you to subject and of course that's going to create problems and issues and moral issues and we haven't done it yet and obviously you could just not do it but clearly people are going to do it because they're awful and they're more interested in making money than <laughs> doing what's right for humanity so uh, clearly they haven't this, watched the matrix yeah so we're, we're stuck on this uh downhill slope but in the meantime i hope you enjoyed this movie where it just goes terribly at the end well, I think that's a pretty good transition into overall notes because, you know, talking about robots in general, you know, robots are more and more, like you're saying, of a an actual reality. They're not just relegated to sci-fi as science is able to, um, you know, create really creepy walking robots in Japan and stuff like that. Um, but art, literature and films and stuff like that is a way for us to uh, project the, the kinds of things that science is creating and will be creating and kind of test out some different eventualities and some different possibilities and see them out to one possible conclusion, um, which I think is really interesting. And then which is one of the biggest strengths of sci-fi um, is the fact that they can do that. And uh, as, as a little bit of a departure from things like aliens, where we talked about how aliens uh, can be representative of certain moral um, issues, robots can, they can do that, like we saw in the Iron Giant, but they can also just be, um, you know, legitimate things that are going to happen. They don't have to be um, speculative uh, all the mm -hmm. time. And also, they can be aliens. And also, they can be aliens. So there you go. Yeah, um, no, it all connects. But the other thing that I think is interesting about robots is the way is is jumping off of that, the way that it's changed over time. So we start with um, like piles of bones and teeth being animated um, by a divine being like Zeus or something like that uh, in order to be this kind of artificially created, not quite a human, but it still um, has movement and some level of intelligence to the point where um, we're exploring stories of humans creating AI and we're exploring possibilities in the real world of humans creating AI. Um, and if that is not a huge shift in the way that uh, people view robots, I don't know I don't know what is. And the way that people view themselves, because like you said, it's kind of representative of a God, a God complex um, in humans to some extent. Yeah, yeah, it's totally unhealthy. And... Uh, to quote another very famous scientist, we spent so much time uh, wondering if we could, we never stopped to think whether we should. Is that, is that Jeff Goldblum? That's Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> very famous yes. scientist. Yes. What have we learned today, Alex? Uh, 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 AI is scary. AI is scary. Alien robots are not scary. And robots from the future cannot be stopped. That is the they lesson. Be <laughs> yes, 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 yes. And now for something completely different. All right. So next week, Jonathan, we are going to talk about the famous French comedian, director, art house superstar Jacques Tati. I, uh, I'm, I'm going to assume that's how you say his name. I apologize if that is wrong. So which uh, which Jacques Tati movies are we going to be watching? Uh, so we'll be looking at Monsignor Hulot's Holiday from 1953, Playtime from 1967, and Trafic from 1971. Well, that's about all the time we have for this episode. If you have movie suggestions for us or just want to reach out, I can be found on Twitter at at JS Satchel. And I'm at Alex Geringer. And I'm at the Blue Jay, 1994. And to find links to things that we talked about today, you can view them on the blog at thefilmlings.com. 
If you like the show, let us know. Leave us a review on iTunes so other people will know what we're all about. We definitely appreciate it. Talk to you next time. All right, see ya. Um, you know, to some extent, just yo, the... Yo, Jonathan, you there? Yo, yeah. Can you not hear me? Jonathan. Hello? I'm here. Can you not hear me? Jonathan. Oh, no. Oh, I can hear you now. Oh, you can? Yeah, you're back. Okay, I could hear you that whole time. So oh, okay. That was weird. Yeah, so we've pretty much oh, got it all frick, covered. you're gone again. Oh, you're back. What? Oh, okay. Hello? <laughs> yep, yep, I can hear you. And you're Bad gone. Guy. Oh, jeez. Hello, talking. Still gone. Talking, talking, talking. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, you're back. Oh, you're Aliens. gone. Aliens. Okay. And you're back. Nope. <laughs> you're back, you're back. Uh... Okay, let me just recall you so we don't have to do this every five minutes. I'll call you on your phone. Okay, that's a good call. All right, bye.